Good afternoon. As part of our ongoing uh, briefings prior to the launch of Discovery on STS Mission 114, we have uh, another briefing this afternoon. It is, a, it is a shuttle processing overview. And we have with us today John Cowart, who is the manager of the JSC resident office here at the Kennedy Space Center. He'll have a presentation, and then we'll go to some questions after that. John? Bruce, thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. What I want to talk to you about today, of course, is shuttle processing. Generically, how do we get all shuttles ready to go fly? It's a very lengthy process and pretty detailed, but I'm going to keep it at a pretty high level for everybody. First of all, welcome. You all know where you are. You're in the land of the right stuff. Uh, this is where we've always launched humans from space, and we'll continue to do it, hopefully, for a long time. Now, for those of you from out of town, I always like to start with my You Are Here slide. Uh, for those of you from way out of town, this is where you are. You're located on Merritt Island, which is a barrier island that varies in width from 5 to 10 miles, about 34 miles long. Uh, but we have about 160,000 acres here on the Space Center. We only use, though, about 6,000 of those acres for processing the flight hardware. So the land that we're not using, we've turned over to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and they've established the Merritt Island National Wildlife Refuge and the Cape Canaveral National Seashore. One of the things we're very proud of around here is that we do indeed uh, do all of this very high-tech stuff in the middle of a wildlife refuge, so we're very proud of that. Now, right across the river from here at Kennedy Space Center, we have the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station where we launch a lot of unmanned rockets. And you see, for example, there, there's an Atlas followed by a Delta and a Titan. But, of course, our primary concern is going to be the space shuttle. Let me give you a quick tour around the uh, space shuttle right quick. Very often people refer to the winged thing right there as the shuttle. Those of us in the business refer to that as the orbiter. To us, the shuttle is all of these pieces combined. You have the two solid rocket boosters flanking that large orange external tank, and then sitting on the outside of the external tank just attached to it is, of course, the winged orbiter. We have uh, the orbiters in our fleet are Discovery, Atlantis, and Endeavor. And what amazes me, when this whole thing lifts off, it'll weigh somewhere in the neighborhood of about 4.5 million pounds but we develop 7 million pounds of thrust, which is why we go up at T0. In about eight and a half minutes, we go from a standing start to about 100 miles in altitude, about 1,000 miles downrange, and moving about five miles per second. So it's an amazing thing to watch for those of you who've not seen it before. Here is where every processing mission starts for those of us here at Kennedy Space Center. This is the shuttle landing facility. Uh, also, it uh, has a kind of a more common name among some of us in the processing group. It's also known as the Gator Tanning Facility because what you have here is a 100-yard wide, three-mile-long strip of concrete that is a wonderful place if you're a reptile to come and sun yourself and get nice and warm before you go out for the day's hunt. So we have people who are trained to go out on the runway right before the orbiter comes in to land and get any gators that are sunning themselves off of the runway before we do land. As I said, this is where the missions start. We either land from space or we come on the back of the 747. And we've done some modifications to the orbiter. Improved the brakes down here. We've added the drag chute, so Kennedy Space Center has become the primary landing site. We either come from space, I said, or we come on the back of the 747. If we're on the back of the 747, we have to get it off. Now, the way we do that is we take it over to our 11-story high mate demate device. We pick the orbiter up off the back of the 747, push the 747 out of the way, lower the orbiter down to the ground, and then deploy its landing gear, and then we tow it to one of our three orbiter processing facilities, or OPFs, as we call them around here. Here you see the orbiter about to go into one of those orbiter processing facilities or OPF bays. These are really nothing more than sophisticated aircraft hangars. I'll give you a picture inside of one here in a minute. But let me show you just around the outside of the orbiter right quick and give you a couple of things. First of all, here's the nose or the forward area. This is the crew module. It's where the astronauts are during launch and reentry. Behind that for 60 feet is the payload bay. And then behind that is the aft of the engine compartment, which houses all the plumbing you need for the three main engines. Each one of those main engines develops about 375,000 pounds of thrust here on the ground. But also, here in the back and up around the front, there are 44 smaller jets known as Orbital Maneuvering System Reaction Control System jets. Now, what these allow you to do is to point and steer and do altitude adjustment capability once we're up in space. The big three main engines shut down after eight and a half minutes, and they're not used again. Those 44 smaller jets and then the two Ohms RCS, or the Ohms engines I was telling you about, here's where I hope to convince you I'm a rocket scientist. We use monomethyl hydrazine and nitrogen tetroxide, which are hypergolic chemicals. In other words, they really, really hate each other. When they touch, they explode. I don't need fancy spark ignition devices. They're not cryogenically stored. Very, very simple to use. Open the two valves, boom, rocket propulsion. Extremely simple. The downside is 
they're very toxic. Whenever you see people working with these chemicals, they're essentially wearing a, a, a spacesuit on them so that they don't breathe any of it or get any of it on them. Because if you do, you're going to go to the hospital because you could get very, very sick, or if you had a bad enough exposure, you could die from these chemicals. But as I said, we trade off the ease of use on orbit for that hazardous use down here on the ground. Here's what it looks like inside the orbiter processing facility. And yes, there is an orbiter inside this picture. What this allows you to do is access every square inch of the vehicle, from inside the wheel wells to the top of the vertical stabilizer, everywhere the engineers, technicians, inspectors, all those folks have to get to to do all that work on the orbiter. Now, if you look very carefully right here, you'll see the nose of the orbiter, and then the windows for the crew module would be right there, and then extending back in that direction would be the payload bay. So that's what it looks like inside the OPF. Here is the most labor-intensive thing that we do on the orbit. It's the tile. Now, originally, we had about 30,900 unique individual tile on each orbiter. We've reduced that number to only 25,000 through the use of heat-resistant blankets in some of the cooler areas, like along the top of the wings or the sides of the payload bay. These tile here on the bottom have to dissipate or can withstand about 2,000 degrees of heat. Now, the leading edges of the wings and the nose cap of the orbiter are made of another material called reinforced carbon-carbon. Those can take about 3,000 degrees. What happens during reentry is you set up a shock wave right in front of the orbiter, and that shock wave, the temperature that actually touches those tiles, is somewhere in the neighborhood of about 2,000 degrees. Now, the skin of the orbiter is made of a very unexotic aluminum. It will begin to stretch and anneal around 350 degrees, which is why those two to four inch thick tile have to dissipate somewhere in the neighborhood of perhaps 1,700 degrees before that heat gets to the skin of the orbiter. Very, very effective at what they do. But each tile takes a long time to apply. They're very, very high-tech things. Here's where you want to get to if you're an astronaut, or even if you're me and you want to be an astronaut. This is the flight deck. Commander will be sitting here. Pilot will sit there. And then two mission specialists will sit behind them up at the flight deck. Now, downstairs is the mid-deck area in the crew module, where you can put four more astronauts if you need to. What you see right here are the CRTs for the five computers that we have on board the orbiter. Now, these five computers are running all the time, checking each other, seeing if they all get the same answer. If any one computer gets a different answer than the other four, the other four go to tribal council, and that one is voted off the island. What really happens is, yes, if one gets a different answer, he's turned off. It's not an emergency, but it is something we watch. Because if you lose another computer, then our flight rules dictate, dictate rather, that uh, you should probably be coming home sometime soon. The computers that we use on board the orbiter are 80s vintage technology. Now, for those of you who think, why don't you update it? The reason being, it takes millions of dollars and years and years in order to certify computer hardware and software for use in human spaceflight. It's one of the quickest ways to cause a problem in a mission. If you look at the expendable launch vehicle failures that have occurred over the last 10 years, I think you'd find about half of them are caused by computer hardware or software problems. So we're very, very careful. We've only got five years left in this program. We know how these computers work. We understand all their idiosyncrasies. We're going to stick with them. We're going to fly with them. And for those of you who might suggest, well, perhaps Bill Gates could do it faster, better, cheaper. With all due respect to Bill and Microsoft and everything that they have done for the computer industry in this country, at 17,500 miles an hour and with a pure vacuum right outside your door, control, alternate, delete is not one of our options. Our computers absolutely positively have to work all the time, no exceptions. So that's the flight deck. Here you see the payload bay. Now, every payload we fly has completely different electrical, mechanical, fluid, and data connections. So after every mission, we strip everything out of the payload bay, put the new stuff in, and we're ready to go fly the new payload. Here you see a space lab with a tunnel coming back. And there you see the orbiter docking system. And there the astronauts would go back in there once we're up in space, and they would start doing their experiments. Ah, the most high-tech part of the shuttle, the main engines. After every mission, we take out all three of the main engines, send them to a special lab we have where we examine them, inspect them, and do any repairs that are necessary based on what we find or anything that's just timed out that's been on there long enough. These uh, engines are really, as I said, the most high-tech part of the whole space shuttle. Let me tell you a couple things that really impresses me about them. First of all, they operate at the extremes of temperature. The fuel we use is liquid hydrogen. At minus 423 degrees Fahrenheit, that is the second coldest liquid in the universe. When you combine that with liquid oxygen right there in the combustion chamber in the throat, the temperature there can exceed 6,000 degrees Fahrenheit. That's hotter than the boiling point, not the melting point, but the boiling point of iron. Iron would be a gas at that temperature. So the obvious question is, well, then why doesn't the engine bell melt under that extreme temperature? 
The bell itself is made of hundreds of tubes welded together. And before the liquid hydrogen is sent into the combustion chamber, we flow it through those tubes and we cool the engine bell down. The other thing that's amazing, and most of you have probably heard this one before, but you look, there's a thing over here about the size of a beer keg called a high pressure oxidizer turbo pump or a high pressure fuel turbo pump. We have both of them. If you were to take those pumps and pump water instead of hydrogen and oxygen, you could drain an average size swimming pool every 25 seconds when we're going up the hill. Now, we're ready to build up the stack. We're getting the orbiter ready. We've got to have a stack ready for the orbiter to get onto. Here's what we're going to build it on top of. Here you see the crawler transporter, and on top of that, this big battleship gray thing is the mobile launch platform. Here's a crawler transporter without a mobile launch platform sitting on top of it. You see each one of these treads here is composed of about, oh, 52 individual cleats on each one of those, and you see we have those at all four corners. Each one of the individual cleats there weighs one ton by itself. Now, the crawler transporter has a top-loaded cruising speed of one mile per hour, and it sips the diesel fuel at just 150 gallons per mile. Here's where we're going to do the stack buildup. We take the mobile launch platform and the crawler inside the vehicle assembly building. It's the thing which dominates the landscape out here. 525 feet tall. And there you see the launch control center down beside it. Here you see it's beginning to do the buildup of the solid rocket boosters. Now, what you may not know is that each solid rocket booster is made of four solid rocket motor segments, and we stack them one on top of the other. Here you see two aft segments that have been put down. Here is an aft center segment being put, and then another one will be put over here. Now, we can stack, you know, left, 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 right, right, right. It doesn't matter, left, right, left, right. It'll work either way. But there you see it's beginning to do the stack of the solid rocket boosters. Once the boosters are completely stacked up, we are ready for the external tank. Here you see it right here. Big, beautiful thing. Comes to us from the Michoud Assembly Facility out in uh, Louisiana. Overall, it's about 154 feet long, 27 and a half feet in diameter. When it's empty, it weighs around 55,000 pounds. When it's full of over half a million gallons of hydrogen and oxygen, it weighs 1.5 million pounds. It takes all of the thrust loads of the shuttle through these attach points you see right there. So it is really an amazing thing. There you see the external tank in the vehicle assembly building. We take it from horizontal to vertical, lift it up high, and then we join it in between the two solid rocket boosters in four locations with explosive bolts. Okay, now we're ready for the orbiter. We go over to the orbiter processing facility, whether it's bay one, two, or three. In the case of Discovery this time, it was over in bay three most of the time. Bring it over on top of this transporter. Hook up our cranes in the vehicle assembly building, which will once again take it from horizontal to vertical. You disconnect part of this crane or part of this lifting fixture right here, and then a single crane will take it up and over and gently lower it down and attach it to the external tank in three locations with explosive bolts. We'll spend about a week inside the vehicle assembly building testing all, our all of our uh, interfaces and making sure it's ready to go before we roll out to the launch pad. There you see it. There you see the crawler way heading out to pad B or pad A, and then over here would be pad B. If you're in the crawler transporter and you're going out there to pad A and you've got that thing floored, it'll only take you about six hours to get out to the pad, to go three and a half miles. If you want to go the full four and a quarter miles out to pad B, that's about an eight-hour full shift for you to get there with the whole stack on your back. Here you see what it looks like inside the launch control center. Once again, older computer technology you see right here. Once again, we're going to save money. We're not going to upgrade our computers. These things work. We understand all their idiosyncrasies. It's the same story as, as it is with the computers on board the orbiter. But that's what it looks like inside the firing room. The only downside to being in the firing room is if you go off the wrong pad, you can't see the uh, shuttle lift off because it's, uh, the building just doesn't face in the right direction. A lot of people think it would be exciting, and it is to a certain extent, to be inside the firing room, but it is a, a fairly antiseptic experience because you can't really hear it or see it or feel it like you can when you're standing outside. So those of us in the firing room, after about 10 seconds into the flight, are really very jealous of those of you who are standing outside watching it lift off. Here you see the whole shuttle stack on its way out to the pad. When it gets to the pad, it has to navigate a 5% grade in order to get up to the pad surface. So what happens is the back of the crawler will actually jack up by as much as six feet in order to keep the whole stack level while it's going up that hill. There you see it at the top of the pad. There's the white room. This is where you want to get to if you're an astronaut. That's your last stop on Earth. Everything gets connected. We uh, sit at the pad for usually about four to six weeks. About two weeks prior to launch, we, we usually bring the crew out. We do a countdown demonstration test where we take the crew and we suit them up in their orange suits, 
act just like we will on launch day, send them out there, they go get strapped in, do a lot of simulation. The biggest difference, of course, being uh, usually the rotating service structure is still around the vehicle, and there's hundreds of people working around the vehicle, which on launch days will only be those astronauts and maybe five to seven other people out there on the pad. So a very different experience, but we do get them used to what it's going to be like. Here you see that rotating service structure that I talked about. What this thing does, we actually put the payload inside this thing called the payload change-out room. Now what happens is, usually before the whole shuttle stack gets out to the launch pad, we bring the payload out to the pad, we lift it up until it, it's touching these payload change-out room doors, or the PCR doors as we call them. Those doors will open up, the canister that we have the payload in, its doors will open up. Then this thing called the payload ground handling mechanism, or the PIGM for short, will reach out into the canister, grab the payload, pull it inside the payload change-out room, we close the doors to the payload change-out room, we close the doors to the orbiter, we lower the canister down to the ground, then we take the rotating service structure and we bring it all the way in and around the vehicle in order to provide access for the engineers, technicians, inspectors, and to provide protection from wind and rain and even digested seagull food. And then we take and open up the doors on the orbiter and we insert the payload into the orbiter itself, close the payload bay doors in the orbiter, and then the payload is essentially ready to go fly. So there you see us at the pad now. We have a, a payload inside there. It's ready to go fly. Usually about 10 hours prior to launch, <coughs> we begin filling the external tank with half a million gallons of hydrogen and oxygen. And that process will take about three and a half hours, which is a long time when you consider those little pumps I was telling you about will drain the tank in eight and a half minutes. So we begin the process of filling it, very slow, methodic process. When that's done, we send a team out to do an ice inspection, verify that no ice has formed in any bad areas. Then somebody gets to go wake up the crew if they're even sleeping. Not exactly sure what they would be concerned about. Then the crew has their breakfast, put on their orange pumpkin suits. They drive out to the launch pad, and then one by one, they crawl up inside. There you see them doing their walkout, doing their wave, and there's Eileen, coincidentally. Then they get inside the crew module, get their helmets on, do their comm checks, Verify everything's ready to go, and that's Senator Glenn in the middle right there. Once that's done, we close the hatch on the crew module, verify that the crew module isn't leaking. We kind of bump up the pressure inside. The crew always appreciates that. And then I like to say that all the really, really smart people in NASA get three and a half miles away, leaving these seven individuals with about an hour to an hour and a half to contemplate the career decisions they've made, which have led them to be sitting on the explosive equivalent of a small nuclear weapon. There's really not a whole lot for them to go do, uh, we only have half a dozen or so call-outs for the crew to go do stuff for us from down on the ground. But other than that, they, I'm sure the commander tries to keep it as light as he can inside the crew module. But we continue on with the countdown until finally, T minus 6.6 .6 seconds. We kind of stagger each one of the main engines on the back of the order. We stagger start them. Now, it only takes three seconds for them, for them to come up to full power. And so the obvious question would be, well, then why do you start them at T minus 6.6 .6 seconds? Well, you have to bear with me here for a second and imagine that uh, I'm an external tank uh, with an orbiter just hanging off my chest and then the two solid rocket boosters on my side. What's going to happen is when those engines on the orbiter, as I said, the orbiter is not supported from the ground in any way. It's just hanging on the external tank. When the engines on the orbiter build up their thrust, they will actually bend the external tank by as much as three feet up at the top. Now, this, little, this whole process was identified for us by the folks at the Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama. So they came up with a very technical term for it, and the term is called that bending, and then coming back to pure vertical is called the twang. So what you do is you get bent. Once there's enough stored energy, it'll twang back to pure vertical. How long do you think that takes? 6.6 .6 seconds. That's why we do it. We don't want to be launching when we're all bent over like this. We want to be going straight up. So at T minus uh, 3 seconds, the computers start checking about 100 times a second. Are you at full power? Are you at full power? If any one of those answers with any of those three engines comes back, no, we have an abort there on the pad. But if those all stay good, finally at T0, we are so confident that the solid rocket boosters are going to ignite. We send the command that blows the bolts holding the vehicle to the ground first, then we send the command that ignites the boosters. Granted, it comes less than a thousandth of a second later, but nevertheless, gives you some idea of our confidence. And when that happens, each one of those boosters goes from zero to about three million pounds of thrust in less than half a second. And if you're up on the flight deck and you happen to be napping, this is probably going to wake you up. There you see it. Just as the boosters have ignited, 
Now, also down on the pad at this time, you will have seen about 300,000 gallons of water begin to flow in 30 seconds down onto the pad. The reason being, when the engines ignite, the noise is so loud, it was going, in, going down, hitting the bottom of the pad, and the echo coming back up would knock tile off of the orbiter. So as I said, at T-minus 15 seconds, we begin flowing about 300,000 gallons of water below the pad and then onto the pad surface and help to help deaden that noise so we don't get any of that echo coming back and knocking tile off. Here's a fairly critical point. When the vehicle, when the engines get to about this point, we turn over control from Kennedy Space Center to Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. Now, for those of you who have, may not have seen it before, I have a, a real quick 30-second clip of what it looks like inside the crew module when you go for engine start in that initial ascent. If y'all could roll that for me right quick. Modeling. There we go. There you go. Now, what's really cool is if you follow that all the way to the end of the eight and a half minutes, uh, you kind of, just as the main engine shut down, you do kind of see them lurch forward just slightly. But the real cool thing is then one of the crewmen holds up a pin and lets go of it. It just floats there. So in eight and a half minutes, you've gone from being down here in this gravity well to being up in zero G. Here you see the vehicle at about 20,000 feet. It has rotated to a heads-down configuration. The vehicle is more stable that way, and it also gives the crew better reference if they have to do an abort. About two minutes and six seconds into flight, the solid rocket boosters are jettisoned because they're about done. They continue on in a giant arc, finally about 150 miles out in the ocean. A small drogue chute will first deploy, then three larger chutes will deploy and lower them down into the ocean. There you see the drogue chute. Once again, to give you a sense of scale, you see that one drogue chute, but then it's going to deploy the three mains. Each one of the main parachutes on, on each of the boosters weighs one ton by itself. One ton seems to be the nice round number we have in this program for a lot of things that we do. But there you see, then one of the ships, once it splashes down, one of the ships in our NASA Navy will go out there, retrieve them, take them from what we call bobbing up and down to what we call log mode, bring them back to the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station across the river from us here. They will take them apart, clean them, inspect them, ship them back to Utah. Our friends with Thiokol will refill them with solid propellant. They'll ship them back to us, and we will reuse the solid rocket boosters. Now, you may remember we last left our seven heroes still going upstairs when the boosters separated. Well, here you see it at the end of that eight and a half minutes. The tank is essentially empty. It is jettisoned. The tank will then float away, as you see it does right there. It doesn't have quite enough speed to stay in orbit. So usually somewhere over the Indian Ocean or the South Pacific, it will re-enter and most of it will burn up. The orbiter, on the other hand, about 30 minutes into the mission, will fire its orbital maneuvering system engine. Remember those, those special hypergolic engines that I spoke of? It will fire those again, or for the first time, in order to give it that tiny little extra burst of speed that it needs to stay up in orbit, whereas the uh, external tank will re-enter. Then the first thing they do once on orbit is open up the payload bay doors. Those are giant freon-filled radiators. We have hundreds of electronics boxes. Seven heavy-breathing astronauts just been through the ride of their lives. And we need to cool them down, and that's what the radiators do for us. Then they get to start doing all that really cool astronaut stuff that they do on orbit, and I'll leave most of that to my friends over at the Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. They're the ones who are responsible for all that on-orbit stuff. Get to do a lot of cool things. We can deploy satellites. One of the neatest ways to do it is to take the robot arm. You can capture a satellite like the Hubble, or you can deploy a satellite. The robot arm, what it would do is just be to grab the payload, whatever it is, hold it up above the shuttle, release it, and then the orbiter just backs away, leaving it in whatever orbit it was in. This is probably the most fun. I would I'd call this getting to go outside and play. You put on your own personal spaceship, and you go outside, and right there, 250 miles below you, is your home planet going by at five miles per second. I, I can't imagine anything that would be more exciting than being able to do that. One of the interesting things on the International Space Station, the way the airlock is arranged, when you open up the hatch to the airlock, it faces straight down. So one of the astronauts, the first one out, when he opens it up, all he can see is the Earth below him. So if you have a fear of heights, you're not invited to apply to be an astronaut, I can assure you. Here's, of course, what dominates the manifest for the rest of the shuttle's life. Now, usually somewhere over the Indian Ocean, Australia, basically on the other side of the Earth, we turn the orbiter around, 
fire those orbital maneuvering system engines again for the last time. They will not be used again to slow us down just enough so that we begin the reentry process. Usually somewhere west of California, they begin to feel the effects of the Earth's gravity, and not the gravity, but the, the heating that comes from the entry interface at around 400,000 feet. And then they come into Kennedy Space Center. They <coughs> land on their mark every single time, not just because they're great pilots to start with, but because we also train them in a special aircraft we have uh, that simulates how the shuttle flies or how the orbiter flies. They roll out, and we start that process all over again. In a normal year, normal mission processing times, it takes us somewhere in the neighborhood of about six months to get the orbiter and the whole shuttle stack ready to go fly. And there you have it. That's how we get shuttles ready to fly here at Kennedy Space Center. So, Bruce, I'll give it back to you. All right, thanks. Well, uh, we're going to open it up for some questions. John makes it over here and takes a seat. Uh, so we've got a microphone. Wait for the mic, please. Give us your name and affiliation. And so any questions? Okay. Mike, right here. Hi, uh, Mike Schneider, Associated Press. I was wondering, given that you had done this in more than two years, the whole processing, um, was there any element of being a little rusty in uh, any, say, lost information? Or was it pretty much uh, as easy as if you had been doing this four or five times a year in the past two years? I wouldn't say that uh, there was any lost information. This is, yeah. I wouldn't say there was any lost information. I would say that, yeah, any time you've waited two, two and a half years to go do something you used to do three or four times a year. There's going to be some element of, let's see, now did I do it this way? Our procedures try to take that into account and in the way we process the, the procedures are very, very detailed. Uh, of course, you do have some experience factor as you would in any job. So I would say that, uh, no, we weren't too rusty. There were probably a couple of occasions where we consulted with each other and said, is this the way we did it before? But uh, we took the time and did it right. All right, up here. Wait for the microphone, please. All right. Randy Abera, Randolph Publishing. John, as we look around Kennedy Space Center today, we see the VAB Vehicle Assembly Building with repairs from hurricane damage. Do you know of, or could you elaborate or tell us anything you may know of about NASA's plans to improve the facilities here on Merritt Island and right out on the, on the launch pads at Kennedy Space Center? for not only the remainder of the shuttle program, but also the future possibilities of commercial space operations here at the Kennedy Space Center. Well, let's see, I can, I can address the, the shuttle piece of it. I don't know what would happen over on the expendable launch side. But as far as uh, with us on the shuttle, I know we have a lot of money dedicated every year to maintenance of our facilities. Uh, there are a few upgrades we're doing, uh, trying to, to make sure that we stay as current as we can but we have to keep an eye on the fact that, yes, this program is going to come to an end. We want to be wise stewards of the taxpayer's money. So we don't want to do anything we don't have to do in order to get this program to the, uh, the end of its mission. Now, with that said, we know there's going to be a follow-on mission. We're not going to let anything just dwell to the point where we know on the, the launch day of the last mission that is the end of life of that piece of hardware. We want to make sure that we are, are well set uh, to proceed on into the next program however that wants to be done. There are a lot of ideas about how you go do that, whether you use a shuttle derived vehicle or you just use expendables. We're not 100% certain what we're going to go do. So what we're trying to do is make sure we are positioned with, with good facilities, even at the end of the program. We have to be just as safe on the last mission as we are on the first. Make sure we're positioned in order to, to stay current and go on with whatever the next program might be. So are you saying that you're, you're not aware if NASA has a dedicated program to address the hardening of the critical facilities for future space vehicle processing? I'm not involved at that level, Randy, so i got to say I don't know for sure. But I, as, I, as I said, I know we are making sure we're good for the remainder of this program and the start of the next one. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Let's take it over there by the door, please. Richard Sisk, New York Daily News. Has anything changed? since Columbia in this drill you just went through about a typical uh, shuttle launch and if anything has changed has that been brought about by uh, much has been said about the culture at NASA and the can-do attitude at NASA that perhaps contributed to the Columbia tragedy? I would say our, our procedures Richard are uh, even more detailed now. We do more things. Uh, we're doing more detailed inspections with better equipment on our wing leading edge and, the, and uh, as well as the, uh, the nose cap on the orbiter. Um, 
as far as the, the attitude is concerned, uh, everybody, um, you, you know Columbia obviously hit us like a, a punch in the gut, so everybody is very dedicated to doing it right. We have reviewed all of our procedures. Uh, we have added a lot of steps to the procedures, added new inspections that have to, to be done. Uh, there is some new processing to do with the orbiter boom sensor. Uh, there has been some instrumentation added to the orbiter. So with all that, yes, there's been a lot of added work, and, uh, and we're taking our time about doing it like we always do. Okay. Guy Gugliotta from the Washington Post. Uh, John, could you describe uh, what kinds of effects weather has on a launch and uh, what sort of discriminates between go and no go as far as weather goes? I'll do the best I can, although I am not a meteorologist by degree, and my, apologi my apologies to Kathy Winters if I, if I misspeak too far. So I'm going to make sure that I, I don't go too far on a limb with my uh, expertise in meteorology. Uh, we, of course, have to worry about winds at the launch pad. Uh, you don't want to have the, the whole shuttle stack. I, I know it's difficult for people to conceive that a four, four and a half million pound vehicle could be moved by much wind, but it does happen. The vehicle does crawl uh, as it starts to lift off. So we have to worry about those. Usually what is more of a driver from a weather uh, perspective for us is crosswinds during a return to launch site landing. We have to worry about those. Um, the other aspect, of course, is uh, rain and clouds. Uh, obviously, we're not going to lift off through rain. The tile just can't take that. We have to worry about thunderstorms within 20 miles because of the implications of that storm moving in over the area or perhaps the anvil head of a thunderstorm coming over and obscuring. We also have a certain, uh, we have all these new cameras located around that have to be able to see the vehicle, uh, particularly for these first two missions, that have to be able to get a very clear view of the vehicle during its ascent so that we can see if any debris is liberated from the external tank and hits the orbiter. So I think yeah, that's about as far as I want to venture into meteorology today. Does that help? Okay. Okay, got it. Randy again? All right. Randy Avera, Randolph Publishing. The Columbia Accident Investigation Board had looked into the coordination of engineering and operational issues on the space shuttle from Kennedy Space Center uh, between KSC and JSC. And I understand that the uh, JSC resident office has a new name. Could you also elaborate about changes in the procedures between uh, Kennedy Space Center and Johnson Space Center uh, during normal processing periods as well as during uh, days leading up to countdown and into countdown? Okay. Yeah, that's a good question, Randy, because the, uh, what was called the JSC Resident Office is now the Orbiter Project Support Office, and that reflects the real nature of, of the job that uh, they have to go do. Uh, we want to coordinate the, the way the program is arranged. You have the shuttle program, and then you have the major projects of external tank and booster and orbiter underneath that. Uh, what you're seeing is a lot more coordination between the Orbiter Project Office at Johnson Space Center as well as the processing folks here at Kennedy Space Center. Now, there's supposed to be a delineation between ground processing and, and orbiter design, but because the orbiter design folks represented by the, represented by the orbiter project know so much about the design of the orbiter, they can give a lot of information to the ground processing folks, and the ground processing folks know a lot about how the hardware works, and they feed that back to the orbiter project, the designers. So the orbiter project support office, uh, after the Columbia accident, has been increased by 100%. So there are a lot more people now doing that liaison work, not to mention there are more just plain old more meetings and telecons that go on between Johnson Space Center and, uh, and the Kennedy Space Center. So I would say there's been a significant increase in the coordination that has to be done. Okay. In, in the organizational chart, where does the, the new um, uh, U, what is it, OPSU, where does it fall into the new org chart? Is it where it used to be? or? Is it at a different level where it has a, a definite streamlined energy to get the job done correctly? Uh, it now shows up, I'm, I'm usually on a KSC org chart where it may not have done that before. But uh, its position is the same. We, are, we re report directly to the Orbiter Project Support Office, OPSO, reports to the director of the Orbiter Project, Steve Polis, and then we, on a daily basis, talk with the head of shuttle processing uh, and, and shuttle processing engineering between Mike Wetmore and Charlie Abner. Uh, 
we touch base with them every day. We sit in their meetings. We know exactly what's going on. So, okay. okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, not seeing any. Uh, just a programming note at uh, 3 o'clock today, Eastern Time, I uh, have a discovery processing overview, and that will be with Stephanie Stilson, who is our discovery vehicle manager. She'll give us some very specific information on what the orbiter discovery itself went through prior to this mission. Uh, then at about 4.30 today, or as soon as the mission management team completes its uh, launch minus two-day review, uh, we do have our STS-114 pre-launch readiness press conference in this room. Thank you very much.